Hey everyone, um, we're here discussing our crash course in culture. This is part two, um, where we're going to discuss the values that affect culture. In part one, we discussed um, some of the ideas of ethnicity and movement, along with cultural diffusion and how colonization plays a role in not only um, culture, but language and things like that. But now we're going to be focusing on values. So we're going to watch a quick video, and then we're going to discuss um, some of these concepts of value, of cultural value, in um, more detail. Both international travel and immigration have helped to increase communication and shared ideas among various cultures. As cultures learn more about each other, it becomes easier to understand and appreciate our similarities and our differences. Cultures place high value on a variety of things, including material objects, social relationships, technical ability or craftsmanship, artistic ability, education, and religious beliefs. The values and beliefs of each culture are unique, often shaped by the history or experiences of each community or region. In some cultures, Older people are cherished for their wisdom and experience, and value may be attached to a person's inner thoughts or metaphysical enlightenment. By contrast, some cultures place great value on the abundance of material objects. Individual skills in creating art are highly valued in some cultures. This artist in North Carolina is creating unique one-of-a-kind objects from clay. In Ghana, ceramicists have perfected the craft of working with clay to mass-produce affordable, fuel-efficient cook stoves. Their work has helped to reduce carbon emissions and helps people save on their cost of fuel. In virtually all cultures around the world, skills and knowledge are passed from generation to generation. Some cultures place great value on nature with a deep appreciation for natural beauty and wildlife. Spending time outdoors, enjoying a beach or a sunset is inspiring and relaxing to people in many cultures. In some cultures, art provides both meaning and enjoyment to people's lives. Education is a valued asset in most cultures, as seen in this school in Afghanistan. Teachers of all kinds possess knowledge or talent admired and valued by most societies. Whether a school is formal or informal, religious or secular, rich or poor, the values and beliefs of a culture are passed from one generation to the next. So I ask you, what are some of the things that your family values? Um, it might be material things like we saw in the video. Maybe your family values having the latest and greatest technology. It could be the fact that your family um, really enjoys spending time in nature, and that's something you do as a family on a regular basis. It could also be things that aren't as easy to capture. Um, family values can include things that can't be seen, such as honesty or integrity, um, pride of your family. Okay, so every family has values and every society has values and that is something that greatly affects culture. Take, for example, the indigenous people of Greenland, um, known as the native Inuits. They stress living with nature, okay? So they place a high importance or place value in connecting with their physical environment. If you look at the pictures to your right, these are all pictures of the Inuit people connecting with their environment and um, interacting with nature.
So that's something that's very important in their value system. Another cultural value that's of great importance to many different cultures is religion. So in the same way that colonization affects cultural aspects such as language, it also affects values like religion. If you take, for example, Latin America, we know that Spanish is the main language in Latin America because Spain is the country who mostly colonized the area of this new world. So it's no surprise that Latin America's main religion is Roman Catholicism because that is also Spain's main religion. Since religions are of such a large component of culture, Many times, when a religion spreads to a new location, the chances for conflict can be great. Conflicts over religion have been um, documented since the beginning of time. Um, Christianity is no exception. Uh, Christianity divides, and we have the Great Schism. So many of you know that with Jesus came a new religion called Christianity. For about a thousand years, Christians were one unified group. Over time, however, there was a split between the West and the East called the Great Schism, and this happened about 1054 AD. Christians at this point were divided into two groups, the Roman Catholic Church of the West and the Eastern Orthodox Church of the East. Eastern Orthodox churches are divided into groups, each with its own leader, so no one leader is more important than the others. They do not have a pope, as the Roman Catholic Church does. So that's one of the main differences between the Roman Catholic Church and the Eastern Orthodox Church, is that the Roman Catholic Church, the pope is the um, highest person in that hierarchy, and then in the Eastern Orthodox Church, the highest person depends on the nation um, that is practicing the Eastern Orthodoxy. We've discussed before about the nationalism that's in the region of the Balkans, and we've talked about how the mountains provide a physical um, boundary that kind of separates the people of the Balkans. But it's interesting to note that Eastern Orthodoxy also contributes to nationalism in Eastern Europe. Since there's no pope, the churches in a nation or a country are usually one group. So there's a church of just that nation. For example, there's the Bulgarian Orthodox Church, the Russian Orthodox Church, and some people might have heard of the Greek Orthodox Church. For this reason, East Orthodox churches usually work with the government and are a part of the national culture. Despite the fact that these factions practice slightly different rituals depending on the country, they all share a common cultural bond that they um, adhere to the principles of Eastern Orthodoxy. Conflict between Muslims and Christians in the Balkan region and in Eastern um, Europe and also um, Southwest Asia has a long history, and so religious conflict um, is something that's of great importance um, in the world, but also in this area where you have um, all of these monotheistic religions kind of competing um, for most significance. And we'll get into that more when we start to discuss some of these cultures in depth. So we've talked about religious conflict, and we've talked about conflict between the indigenous peoples during colonization. Um, basically, the people that are lacking power are being told they have to give up their culture. They can no longer celebrate holidays um, that were important to them. They can't engage in certain religious ceremonies or dress a certain way. Um, as teenagers, guys, imagine being told that, okay? How do you react if you're told that you can't dress a certain way or practice certain beliefs, right? Um, it's not something that people in general take kindly to. So the restrictions um, on culture aren't limited to just colonization or religion. Culture can also be changed due to political conflict as well. And we talked about this before earlier in the year, but if you lived in Eastern Europe in the mid-1900s after World War II, 
This might have been your fate. Basically, communist leaders who ruled most of Eastern Europe after World War II tried to control almost all aspects of their citizens' lives. People were punished for practicing the religion that they wanted, or they were also punished for criticizing the government. Eastern Europe isn't the only place in the world where politics have um, affected culture, but it's a good example of a geopolitical region. Culture here has created the boundaries and factors such as ethnicity, religion, language, economics, and history really separate Eastern and Western Europe. We'll dig into this a little bit later in future lessons, but the um, communist rule of the Soviet Union really tried to spread as far west as possible. And these states that are lighter, a little bit lighter red, um, part of Germany, Poland, um, Hungary, Romania, Bulgaria, these areas here were um, an area called the Iron Curtain or the Eastern Bloc. And basically, this was an area that was supposed to shield um, the more eastern regions of the Soviet Union from the western culture and ideals of countries like the United Kingdom, France, Spain, um, Switzerland, Italy, and the western part of Germany. Okay, so... There's um, a lot to do with politics and how politics affected culture. We saw that a lot when we discussed Central Asia with the stands countries, right? And how the Soviet Union really affected those areas. And so um, we'll focus more on the politics in the future, but I want you guys to be aware that it's not just religion and um, religious values and um values that kind of come through us to us from cultural diffusion it's all also politics that affects our culture as well sometimes cultures are so distinct within an area that you have something called ethnic enclaves so an enclave is a portion or territory that's surrounded by a larger territory whose inhabitants are um, culturally or ethnically distinct if you take, for example, this area in Spain, there's a region called the Basque region. And if you look here, it's the colorful region kind of right up near France. And the Basque region is a region that where they speak their own language and they really have their own cultural identity. However, they're still in the Basque region, a part of Spain overall. You also see this in North America um, in Canada. Quebec has its own distinct cultural identity that's not necessarily shared by the um, rest of Canada. And so sometimes there's conflicts that do arise because of these differences. So Quebec is a cultural enclave. Um, French Canadians have kept their own language and laws, especially in Quebec, which is mainly French. And this has caused friction between the Quebecois and the English speakers. As a result, the Quebec government mandates that all public signs and government work be printed in French. Quebec has even voted on leaving the Federation of Canadian Provinces, but as of yet, there is not enough support for independent status. However, Quebec enjoys cultural independence from the rest of Canada. So while politics um, affects the culture of an area, so do the socioeconomics. Socioeconomic means any topic that involves a combination of social and economic factors. So unlike the societies of the former Soviet Union, successful societies all share some of the same characteristics. And those characteristics are um, having a long life expectancy, having access to health care, not necessarily universal health care, but just access to it, having access to public education, and having a high literacy rate. Literacy means the ability to read and write. So 
when cul- when cultures or societies share these characteristics, they are oftentimes successful. Education plays a big role in the socioeconomic status of a country. As you learned, education impacts the overall success of a country, and it also impacts a society's culture. Having a high literacy rate is really important for the success of a society. Because let's think about it. If the educational system is poor, it's next to impossible for a country to compete in the global market, right? And studies actually show that increased literacy rates um, result in healthier children and more prosperity. So if a country cannot provide educated professionals, like say, for instance, doctors or nurses, how can it have a healthy society? So education is really important for a socioeconomic status. And the higher your socioeconomic status, usually the more successful your country. This map I felt was pretty important. If you just take a minute or two to look through this, um, whenever you have a free second, there's not a question about this specifically on the IA, but I want you guys to take a look at some of the darker regions. The darker the region, the, the higher the literacy rate. So you can see in the United States, we're 91 to 100% with um, literate, as well as Russia, Europe, Australia, and then parts of South America. But then you look into the lighter colored countries um, of the world and the lighter blue, the less literacy. So you notice that there are areas in um, South Asia as well as Africa um, and even Central America and South America that do do not have high um, literacy rates And it's interesting to note that a lot of those nations are also those who are considered um, what we used to call third world, or now we're considering them developing countries. And they're developing because they don't necessarily have a high um, literacy rate or education rate. All right, guys, that is our cultural crash course. It's about a half an hour total between parts one and parts two. Um, If you watch these, it will greatly help your um, success on the interim assessment for Instructional Cycle 2. And if you have any questions, please let me know. Um, I hope you enjoyed it, and we will be digging into culture a little more next week. Thanks, guys.